This is Yesterzine, the monthly magazine show about monthly magazines. We take a magazine from the golden age, play the games they liked most and least, and flip through to find out what gaming was like before anyone knew what EA Sports was. Well, sort of, but we'll get to that. It's 1992, and Future decide to launch a new magazine. Sega Power is already there, covering all the Sega machines and making sexist comments. And Future decide what the world needs is a more focused magazine to just cover Sega's still pretty new Mega Drive exclusively. And apparently, make sexist comments. Still, it's an exciting time to be a gamer in the UK. We're just off the launch of the SNES at this point, and the Mega Drive is making the most of its head start to be storming towards its second Christmas, with Sonic 2 imminent and Mega hubristic enough to already be publishing a top 100 games list for the machine. Our Gaming Heaven is the sequel to what Mega considered to be the Mega Drive's second best game. And if that's the only clue I give you, there is no chance you are guessing what it is. Our Gaming Hell is an arcade conversion where both the original and some of the other ports are pretty beloved. I haven't, though, ever played it on Mega Drive. Elsewhere, possibly the most famous third-party name in modern gaming takes its first tentative steps into the world, and I take on a famous face at a video game a mere 30 years after he played it. All this, and more, the other side of a quick plane trip to America. EA Sports. It's in the game. EA Sports, then. A brand so famous, there are probably a lot of gamers that don't even know there's an EA not sports. And there may be even fewer who know what EA ever stood for. Plenty of publishers have tried a sports sub-brand of some type or another in the decades following, and none of them remain especially the ones EA ended up buying. But in late 1992, there was no EA Sports, because EA Sports began as EA's charming insistence that TV-style presentation is what sports gamers wanted, rather than, to coin a phrase, that everything in the game should perhaps be in the game. EA Sports initially appeared as the EA Sports Network, and their first year or so had worked out rather well. I said you wouldn't guess what Mega considered the Sega Spinning Jenny's second best game, and I stand by my insistence that EA Hockey would not have made your first three guesses. And for a UK magazine, I suspect all of you have assumed Sonic would be number one. But you would be wrong. Sonic only makes number three. Number one was John Madden 92, the second instance of EA Sports' longest running product now, as of this year, sadly outliving John himself. It's a different world though. At this point, neither Madden nor EA Hockey have any licenses. You can see here in Madden 92, the teams are identified merely by their city and a legally non-enforceable colour that may or may not match any team that might choose to call that town home. The players too are not real, a trend that, as we saw right back in Episode 3, remained true in their early sports games even as far as the first appearance of FIFA, where the designers were suspiciously overpowered strikers on several of the teams. It would only be a few years before the EA fans were making fun of Pro Evolution Soccer having teams called Manchester Red, in what at the time was probably the better game. EA, though, absolutely pulled that trick first, and only the money they made from games featuring the Oakland could be anyone allowed them to solve that problem in later iterations. Still, they'd moved the needle on. They hadn't yet come up with their famous slogan, if it's in the game, it's in the game, much less made it completely meaningless by never using that first half. But they already had a reputation for commitment to realism we just hadn't seen in most sports games until now. Mega highlight this in a piece of near suspicious toadying to EA, especially given you've probably already worked out our gaming heaven is also going to be an EA SN title. The premise of the piece is what you need to do to make an Electronic Arts Sports Network game. Have four years spare is apparently the first answer, that being how long they say it took EA to write the original Madden. Given it came out in late 1990, that means they started writing a Mega Drive exclusive American football title in 1986. A Sega exclusive game about an American sport by an American company 
at a time when Nintendo were curb stomping everyone in America and targeted for a machine till two years off release even in Japan. Given the sales figures of history's greatest console in the US, I'm often kind of surprised they even released the Genesis there, and there must have been doubt about that in 1986. I'm not sure I buy it. The next one aged badly too, an insistence that an EA sports game be based on a realistic interpretation of a real sport. That's a commitment they found tricky to keep up. It's actually uphill from there, and the article discusses game design documents, for some reason referred to as scripts, as well as some of the actual process in a realistic detail that results in probably the only time a games magazine will ever use the term product manager in its software development sense. And also correctly defining an alpha as what a modern game will often incorrectly call a beta. Surprisingly quite technical for a games magazine. It also gives away how software teams have expanded since the golden age of video game magazines. Apparently, to make a full realistic state-of-the-art sports video game, you will need a graphics expert. Just the one. And also one musician. Although, given EASN's in-house music guy is C64 legend Rob Hubbard, then I'm actually inclined to believe that one. What I'm not prepared to believe is that Electronic Arts would cancel a bad game but maybe that's just because I've played a lot of EA games over the last 30 years. Hell, while it's not EASN, an electronic arts game technically about sport, Zany Golf, is in the review directory this issue. The final bit of info to be gleaned from this is that EASN are working on games for baseball, motor racing, motorcycling, and getting only a very passing mention, apparently some sort of soccer game. The motor racing game, presumably, was Mario Andretti Racing. The motorbike game might have been Road Rash 2, but that's neither realistic nor released as EA Sports. The baseball game is probably an early iteration of what became Triple Play Baseball. The soccer game though? Who even knows? Okay, time to flex some regional muscles. We're a show for a primarily British audience, so I will have no shame in pointing out that by EA Hockey just then, we mean ice hockey, not hockey. I don't want to get all hand egg about this, but it's relevant, because EA Sports never made a hockey, or field hockey if you will, game, even though they've made just about every conceivable version of football ever to exist at one point or another. Side fact, EA actually did release the first Madden as John and Madden American Football in the UK, a decision only slightly ruined by their practice of releasing most games with only one cart design, which means the cart itself not only removes the word American, but claims to work only on a Sega Genesis. Seriously, if you have a decent sized UK Electronic Arts Mega Drive collection, sports or otherwise, check your cartridges, you'll see this quite a lot. And this is also true when we get to our gaming heaven, NHL PA 93. Declaring an interest early on, I loved this game. Enough that I bought a second US copy on holiday there a decade or so back for the princely sum of $3. A sum that represents more than I paid for the PAL copy I currently own apparently. The cartridges though are identical, both in label and contents. And that means both start with this absolute banger of a Mega Drive title theme. The name NHLPA also gives away a distinction. This one is licensed. Sort of. While the league itself gave no endorsement the Players Association did the PA from the title. So all the player names in the game are correct, but the teams continue the Madden trend of being named after their location, with the New York Islanders being bumped out to Long Island to avoid confusion with what I'm going to confidently say without looking them up is called the New York Not As Shit As Those Guys. And so we start a match between the two in order to teach what I believe is officially known these days as the Long Island Losers a lesson. And it starts pretty well. 
Surprisingly, for a game which has, and I'm not kidding here, an 87-page English manual, the basic controls here are simple. When you have the puck, it's B to pass, it's C to shoot. We used this to good effect early on and take an immediate lead against the Long Island anyone who likes us is an idiot. And it doesn't take us long to add a second. To the point I'm thinking I might have overcommitted by deciding just to play a full game against a team that disgraces themselves and their entire metropolitan area just by existing. Ice hockey is one of those sports that seems simple but really isn't. You can't actually just basketball the puck from end to end. And there's a reason that in reality ice hockey games don't usually end up with cricket scores like basketball matches tend to. One of the big reasons to that comes up a lot in this game. Offside. And I had to look up in that expansive manual how it actually works. Basically, the puck has to enter the last third of the rink before any of my chaps do. The game does help here. You might notice the ref popping up and that's to indicate he's about to call the penalty if you go over the line. To be honest, this is one of my few sore spots with a game you've probably already detected I'm fond of. Possibly the smartest thing I ever heard said about a sports title is that how good they are is often entirely to do with what happens with the players you are not controlling. And while this game usually does very well with that, it's rarely going to be entirely your fault when you get an offside and the others are standing around scratching their asses while you're trying to do a goal. The other thing to watch in ice hockey is penalties. For a game that looks violent, it's surprisingly easy to step over the line, especially in defence, where the C button is a very effective aggressive shove, risking very much that you get one of the available penalties, almost all of which will result in someone being benched for two minutes. You can be penalised for holding, roughing, slashing with the stick, using the stick to block an opponent, tripping, charging, interference or simply by being your mum. My fears that this would be a walkover, or I guess a skateover, are long since resolved as long idiots fluke a couple of goals and then I start to pick up some penalties thanks to those sponge leg divers falling over at the merest hint of contact. It's worth mentioning I've cut out one of the most tricky bits of ice hockey here, line changes, where as often as every couple of minutes the entire team is changed. Ice hockey is a very tiring sport and teams will often have three separate entire sets of players in games which they can swap over at any break in play. This also has the advantage that you can change the attacking balance, especially when you're either getting the advantage or disadvantage of a current penalty. It's even possible in ice hockey to completely dispense with having a goalkeeper when chasing a game to get a slightly artificial man advantage on the actual ice. And the game supports all these things. And this is the thing to me about NHLPA 93. I like a more simple sports game than most modern sims. I've played this on and off for rapidly approaching 30 years without getting either bored or any good at it. I own three copies of it, although granted I paid less than the tenner total for them. But the thing is, despite being simple, despite being something that an uncoordinated jellyfish or a Long Island fan can pick up and understand in about 23 seconds, NHLPA has everything it needs to have. The prevailing wisdom is that the direct sequel NHL 94 is the better game, but I'd disagree. It adds nothing important to the formula. Yes, there's four player play and a couple of minor technical improvements like penalty shootouts. Yes, it runs a tiny bit quicker, but it doesn't need to and that affects its pick up and play nature. In fact, 94 is missing punch-ups, which, while entirely pointless and can get you benched for 5 or even 10 minutes, are very much a part of a hockey. And they're in 93. And indeed in every NHL since 95 as well. You could also point out the fact that NHL 94 is, as its name suggests, the start of the fully licensed era and has all the real teams. And what is apparently called the New York Islanders. But even the box will tell you that it also begins the era of EA Sports being the fully corporate monolith it is today. And to me, there's something charming about New York versus New York but worse. About the EA Sports Network, and about these early titles and the incredible future they were the foundation of. And even if NHL 94 is marginally improved overall, it's not the same. And the music, which has continued to be uncommonly incredible throughout 93, has changed as well. Although, to be fair, that's true even of the SNES version of this game. 
Still, it's not going to be expensive for you to acquire both, even in real cart form. And you emulator bunnies are of course there already. So by all means try NHL 94. But make sure you also give NHL PA 93 a play, if only to redeem the pride of the Long Island at least we're not New Jersey team. Because to me it might just be the most perfect sports title of all time for what a sports game should do. Bring the sport to the people in an understandable, accessible, and above all, seriously bloody fun way. It's reasonably common for a launch mag to try and do something different. You claim to be for the older gamer. You claim to have the most in-depth reviews. Or you go for a gimmick. Welcome to Mega's Gimmick. Interviewing a celebrity while they attempt to play a game at least vaguely connected to the reason they are famous. In this first issue, it's Crichton from TV's Red Dwarf, Robert Llewellyn. Then, a show at the very apex of its sitcom powers as they prepared to film season 6. Or, as it's known today, the last really good one. There never was a proper Red Dwarf game. Two largely unloved mobile efforts mid last decade appear to have been long deleted from all app stores, and all that appears to exist of the one serious attempt at convincing someone to make a proper game appears to be this early 2000s demo I found somewhere I'm deliberately not crediting because they've got a lot of stuff the BBC would probably rather they didn't. So Robert has to play something else, something spacey, and Mega have gone with Thunder Force 3 because it's got a spaceship in it. Wonderful. And here's the challenge. Multiple times during the interview, Bobby gets to the end boss of level 1, the Gargoyle, and then gets his ass handed to him. So it's time to see if I can go one better. A situation complicated by the fact I am awful at shooting games, as anyone who knows me will tell you. Hi, I'm Blogger, and Dudley is awful at shooting games. Now, what's that line you wanted me to record? Yeah, thanks for the support, mate. Still, I'm doing pretty well here. I've managed to keep the vital triple shot thing going. I've not lost any lives to the idiot middle of the stage boss. I'm feeling confident. Oh. Oh dear. Hi, I'm Lee from More Fun Making It and Dudley is rubbish at shooting games. But, but that's fine. This is a first go. This kind of thing could happen to anyone. And, to be fair, Llewellyn got his fair share of chances to... Hi, I'm Stu the Brummy and Dudley is rubbish at shooting games. Yes, I think they get it. And besides, reaching the boss first time is pretty good. It's only going to get better for, oh. I'm Rose Tinted Spectrum, and Dudley is rubbish at shooters. With friends like these, who needs end of level bosses? Still, it's just a matter of believing it, oh God damn it. I'm Matt Spears, and I've got to say, Dudley is rubbish at shooters. Now come on, I have the tiger. Tigers, of course, being famously good at side-scrolling piss flaps. I'm 8-Bit Boy of the Master System Challenge, and Dudley is rubbish at shoot gits. Still, given I famously proved I was better at games than Dave Games Animal Perry a few years back, it's amusing that at worst, what we've now proven is that Robert is better than him as well. And I'll be better than Robert if I can just ball sacks. Hi, I'm Vacant Skull, and Dudley is rubbish at shooting games. Oh, for the love of our type. Okay, this is impossible. There is absolutely no chance that anyone could... Right, move over, my turn. By all means, but it would take the combined talents of Vision and the Flash in order to complete... Oh, never mind, he's done it. Hi, I'm Craig from Retro Respawn, and Dudley is bad at shooting games. Oh, for fuck. Arcade conversions. Tricky in this era of gaming. Hi. I'm Ben from One Credit Classics, the rescuer of Princess Print Print. And Dudley is rubbish at shooters. And tricky for three reasons as well. The first being obvious. An arcade machine used the absolute latest technology and cost several thousand pounds. The point was to wow and dazzle immediately to get you to shovel your tempies in quicker than covering up the body of your latest murder victim. Relatable content. And this meant that a £100 box of plastic wouldn't be able to compete on launch. Never mind that the Mega Drive is technically four years old at this point thanks to the early Japanese launch, and the Master System a full seven. 
So any conversion is not going to be working with the power of the full arcade, and is going to have to drop some stuff somewhere. The second reason is a little more ethereal. An arcade machine is designed to take in money at regular intervals. It has an interest in ending your game quickly. For a single purchase game on a console for 40 quid, how do you mitigate this into a game that won't annoy the piss out of you after an hour? But there's a less talked about problem, especially in this era. Controls. Let's take an obvious one. Here's a Super Monaco Grand Prix arcade machine. You simply don't have a wheel for your Genesis. There never was a real one for the Master System. And in any case, both machines only have digital controls, and that's not how you car. Light gun games are less of an issue. There were famous light guns for these systems. But obviously that's a barrier to entry, especially for Missile Defense 3D on the Master Saster, because that also required you to buy the 3D glasses. This isn't the full extent though. Arcade games could do what they liked, and as early as 1982, Eugene Jarvis and Larry DeMar came up with Robotron 2084, an innovative top-down shooter. Robotron is notable for the sheer amount of stuff happening for a game from the same year as Tron. It's also notable, though, for introducing the famous twin-stick controls, albeit still digital. One stick controls where your craft goes, the other stick controls where you fire. And it's this that makes these games playable to me. I've never been any good with the variants on this theme where you have to fire in the direction you're going, or can't fire and move type systems used by the likes of the Chaos Engine. 1990s Smash TV adopted this, and instantly created a classic by combining the twin stick controls with a plot and aesthetic so close to the movie The Running Man that I start to wonder if Legally Distinct Corner might be a name for a new YouTube series. Which brings us back to the point. Because here, a couple more years later, Mega is looking at the Mega Drive conversion of the game. In an effort to big up these conversions, a lot of them, including the Mega Genesis, Superb Nintendo and Sega 8-Bit, all optimistically put Super Smash TV on the cover although no one thought to tell the developers so all the title screens still just say Smash TV. Mega are not happy. We don't usually look too closely at reviews in advance, but let's make an exception in this case, because it's 37%, and we'll get into why. But the interesting thing is, this is not a universal opinion. Meme Machines gave both the Mega Drive and SMS versions 88%, but the review summary makes it pretty obvious those are typos. Even a meagre action doesn't consider a ghastly conversion that fails on every level an 88% score. That said, CVG genuinely handed an 83 to the 16-bit one, albeit reversing those digits on 8-bit. The SNES port though gets 90s everywhere, including both those two magazines. Time for an important multi-system consumer test using only the finest original emulators. The intro for the Mega Drive 1 isn't promising. Not so much for the intro itself as the demo showing the player literally shooting everywhere except the big boss currently on screen. The default Mega Drive control scheme is interesting. They've got three fire buttons to play with and they've attempted to use them. A fires forward, which is lovely but has the generic problem that you're running towards the horde of enemies that are trying to murder you. So how about B, which fires backwards? This works but you very quickly end up backed into a corner, and the route to success on these kinds of games is always to try and work in circles around the screen. The nearest we have to something that's going to work here is the Chaos Engine style freeze the shooting direction button C, and you can sort of make this work, but a lack of responsiveness when you try to turn around is going to murder you more often than not. This, presumably, is what Mega refer to when they claim the game handles like a runaway piano would handle a chicane. While I love the line, I'm not sure it's that bad. A little awkward perhaps, but I think this is the kind of thing people could get a handle on if they had to, even if this were the only control method available. And actually, it isn't. You see, the Mega Drive of course does support a method for getting two joysticks or d-pads for one player, and stay with me here because this is going to get technical, 
you use an arcane trick handed down from generation to generation called plug in two controllers. Still with me? This works pretty well actually. Once you get over the awkwardness of trying to balance a pair of controllers in a way that you can still access both D-pads successfully. It's not a dual joystick system but it behaves pretty much as well as one and you can see that I'm managing to maintain some sort of pattern here and I actually get through the first couple of screens with the only major incident being running into mines like an idiot. It does allow me to confirm I don't see Mega's other major problem with the game either where they claim the collision detection is dodgy. I dive through several tiny gaps without incident during the playthrough and get very near the end of the first of three big levels before my total of 14 available lives runs out. Time to have a think about this while we check the other two major console versions. The Mars system looks the part and they've at least been a bit clever here. It only has the lock and reverse control buttons thanks to, well, only having two buttons. Tapping the lock button though is of course going to shoot forward if you lose leave of your senses and actually want that. Combined with the game being easier than the Mega Drive one, it works after a fashion. It also handles this number of sprites very well, a weakness of the mask system, but you can still see how they've had to cut down many screens. Like the Mega Drive version, this is by Probe, the team who would go on to squeeze incredible versions of Road Rash and Mortal Kombat onto the machine, so perhaps we shouldn't be surprised. Unfortunately though, despite it being theoretically possible on the machine, this does not support the two pad control scheme idea and I suspect that's a factor in its wildly varying review scores. Even as the machine's designated cheerleader, I can't suggest this is the version you actually want to play in 2022 when much more complete games are available. The SNES port isn't by Probe. It's by Beam Software, and immediately it looks and sounds different. More importantly though, the SNES has an advantage the Mega Drive does not. Its pad has four fire buttons arranged like this. So you could potentially fake a two stick style control system using a single pad, and that is exactly what Beam have chosen to do. That's not their only changes though. You get more continues on the SNES version and it makes some elements, especially those mines, a bit more visible to make it easier on you. The control scheme is a triumph immediately. It's not perfect faking a stick with four separated buttons, but it's a lot better than playing balance the joy pads and this version seems more free with its power ups. These changes and more contribute to me coming very, very close to killing the bullet sponge first world boss before I get a game over. I can see why this is the version that the magazines in general preferred. They were given a control scheme advantage, sure, but Beam also took to heart what I discussed at the beginning of this section and changed the game to take into account a little that it's not actually trying to fleece a coin out of you every 30 seconds. That said, I still disagree with Mega. The Sega port is by no means a disaster and so I wonder why Mega gave it such a low mark. My first assumption is maybe they didn't try the two fake stick control system, but why would they? Really why would you ever try the other one? And then it hit me. I think they had an unfinished version of the game, knowingly or otherwise. It would account for the technical failings they point out that don't seem to have befallen me. Maybe the collision detection was polished up in late development and the two stick system added. That would also, to a degree, explain its absence from the Mars System version, which could well have had a short development cycle. As released, I can't quite agree with their 37%, although I'm not sure I see the late 80s it got elsewhere either. But neither can I quite convict Mega in a court of games reviewing lore. What I do know though, is even if you want to play a period appropriate console port of Smash TV, the Mega Drive version isn't your friend when the SNES one exists especially as one of the great joys of Smash TV is two player co-op and if you're on the Mega Drive you cannot use the two joypad scheme with this as the game does not support four controllers. That said though, these days in the home you should probably be doing neither. If you have any of the Xbox 360, One or Series or a PlayStation 3 then this game and its spiritual sequel Total Carnage are on the compilation Midway Arcade Origins whose 360 release is backwards compatible. 
then you can actually use twin sticks the way God, or at least Midway, intended. It's also on the first Midway Arcade treasures for the PS2, Cube, Windows and the original Xbox. While all these console ports tried hard in their own way, ultimately they're solving a problem we can solve better in 2022 by playing official later releases of the arcade machine. And ultimately that's probably a better idea if you want to recreate a popular Arnold Schwarzenegger movie without having to find out you're related to Danny DeVito. Hi, my name is Neoki and Dudley is rubbish at shooter games. So that was broadly the state of the Mega Drive a year or so into its UK lifetime. A year isn't a long time, but Mega thinks it's already worth doing a top 100 games. To be fair, the Mega Drive is drawing from a near four year library in Japan, but unless the lower end of this table is going to be sexy Mahjong, even sexier Mahjong, actually slightly disturbing Mahjong, and best of Mahjong sexy edition, then I'm not sure that's going to help as much. The top end of the table we've covered. Madden, Ice Hockey, Sonic. But this early on in the life of the Genesis Drive, there's a few I wouldn't have expected. Fourth is Toa Plan's Space Shooter Hellfire. That Mega consider it a game quite this good makes me immediately ask why Bobby and I were playing Thunder Force. That said, I won't need to sell Hellfire to the shooter fans, but to non-shooter fans, you need to know Toa Plan are also responsible for this. Zero Wing, or as we know it, the All Your Base game. Makes number 70 in this list, mainly due to being too easy. So I've clearly got to go have a bang on that one to make me feel better once we're finished here. Hi, I'm Cogweasel, and Dudley is rubbish at shooting games. Even worse than I am. Praise the gods. That a game Mega suggests you can finish in three tries makes the top 70, tells you that there isn't going to be much depth in the rest of the list. At 76 is El Viento, no me and me neither, which Mega praise as another bog standard platform beat em up. By 83 we're at Bonanza Brothers, which they praise as limited two player fun and don't attempt a one player game. 87 is Space Harrier 2. I don't like Space Harrier, but even people who like Space Harrier don't like the Mega Drive version of Space Harrier 2. 100? Dick Tracy, which walk along, occasionally jump over a letterbox because walking round them is apparently impossible, and shoot some goons. Maybe save the top 100 for next year chaps? Who even is going to have close to this size of library after a year anyway? That's about three grand's worth of games. And yet, there is still room for a top 10 worst games list. And there's a heady mix of generally acknowledged classics and ones that are going to invoke some debate. I don't think anyone has especially fond memories of Onslaught, a game which I could probably get you to believe I'm showing the Master System version of here, but also has a tendency to kill you entirely at random. But plenty will of the Sega World Cup game which gets fifth worst to place. And not through competition either, literally the Mega Drive's only other football game at this point is European Club Soccer, which floats in the lower regions of the top 100. Thankfully, Sensible and FIFA are both less than a year away. But the bottom three are all Sega games. Turbo Outrun, a conversion Sega admitted was awful a couple of years later. The grab bag of tropes that is plodding beat-em-up last battle is number two. And while I agree this is a lot better game than game one, I know most of you are about to get cross, because the number one worst game on the Mega Drive out of at least 110 is Altered Beast, the original packing title, a fondly remembered arcade classic, and, and awful. Sorry, it just is. I'm with Mega on this one. But the rest of you feel free to travel back in time 30 years and write in. 
I'll join you actually, because as much as Altered Beast is a crime against nature, it's absolutely less awful than Space Harrier 2. And on the back page, a word from our sponsor. Hi, I'm Watto Snorkers, and Dudley is rubbish at shooting games. Get out. On the back page today, the literal back page of my copy of the magazine, scanned by the lovely people at the Out of Print Archive. The astonishing preservation work of this site has bailed Yesterzine out of things on multiple occasions, and it's their scan of the issue you've been seeing throughout this show. But they've scanned many a magazine from the Golden Age, be they Sega, Nintendo, PC or multi-format, and they don't stop re-scanning things until they're perfect, even if that takes more tries than this show will run a gag into the ground for. I'm Reese from Control Alt Reese, and Dudley is rubbish at shooters. So head over to outofprintarchive.com today, and if you can help them out, so much the better. If nothing else, there's an absolute guarantee you'll be getting a sneak peek at a future Yesterzine by doing so. And indeed, if you want to get a non-sneak, non-peak at future Yesterzines, the mechanism is to press subscribe if you want to put it in your feed, press the bell if you want a chance YouTube might tell you it's done this, and hit like to put the show on a few more people's homepages. Or at least, that's the theory. YouTube operates by its own plane of reality most of the time. However you manage it though, join us in exactly four weeks for March's dose of retro game important journalism. Hey there, I'm Duke Nukem, and Dudley is rubbish at shooting games. Hi, I'm Kate, and Dudley is rubbish at shooting games. Hi, I'm Sandy, and Dudley is rubbish at shooting games. I'm Goldfish on games, and Dudley is rubbish at shooters. I'm Tim from Retro Team, and Dudley is rubbish at shooters. Hi, I'm Mark, and Dudley is rubbish at shooting games. Hi, I'm Rex, and Dudley is rubbish at shooting games. Hi. I'm Dr. Andrew Swan, qualified science test. I've run the numbers, I've done the calculations, and Dudley is rubbish at shooting games. He's bad, he's awful, he's terrible. He failed all our tests, he crashed our system. His incompetence is just impossible to quantify. In fact, we've never had a worse specimen. He is quite literally the worst of all time.